What were you saying, Bryce? Just saying, look forward to uh, seeing you on the road, man. Uh, you, uh, you have any shows <laughs> in your breath. future? Don't hold your breath, my man. Don't hold your breath. You, you haven't been on the road in a while. We do need to catch up, by the way. I, I get. I'm, I'm going to ping you next week just to do a general catch up, Jeff. Yeah, please do. Please do. Anytime, man. I'm always here for you. I, I know. This, I appreciate that, Mr. Bryce. I got called Jeff Clark. He called me earlier this week. I never called him back. I talked to him in forever either. I heard Digital Dealer was just a good uh, a good reunion. I didn't make it, but but uh, sounded like a lot of a lot of yeah. folks slapping high fives and hugs and just just getting the auto family back together. Yeah, I bet that's what I heard. This is neat. Yeah, it's, yeah. We'll be we'll be know. doing that in Vegas, right? Definitely. Oh, I'll eventually find some time to, and the urge to get out. I'm I'm just in no rush to be traveling. I mean, I should say I'm in no rush to jump on a plane. Not the way crazy people cra- are crazy today. I don't know. I just um, I just have a funny feeling it'll put me in a uh, get myself in a, in a situation that that doesn't turn out too well for me. <laughs> uh, they're not that bad on the planes. They just make you wear No, a mask. but I, I feel like, and then they beat you I if you like, take it off. For yeah, me. exactly. I feel like I, I, I could potentially be at some boiling point, you know, and I don't, I'm afraid that something may trigger me. And then all this pent up yeah. anger just comes out. <laughs> I'm what, the wrong what, person. What, what <laughs> I really I'm, like to... I'm in jail. <laughs> <laughs> what would trigger you? Yeah. Like, like the bag of nuts? Like, nah, just someone being a jerk. Yeah. Someone, you know, saying something that they don't need to say. Someone, you know, I mean, just someone being someone, you know? Totally. <laughs> yeah. Hmm. I should probably just stay clear for a while. Speaking of uh, planes, we were going through my my dad's stuff and uh, went through his photo album on his phone. It's after he died, for anyone to know. And Mm -hmm. we got four seconds here. I'll tell the story once we come over here. All right, so fishing right. on, but I'll finish that, that story, story real quick. Yeah, so we were we were going through his things and um, going through his photo album, and he has got years of videos. I guess ever since he started carrying an iPhone, of people chewing gum at airports, and just For like real? the ridiculous. Why? Oh, he he hated gum chewing. Like it just <laughs> he would say it makes you look like a cow. Um, <laughs> all this video he must have been such a creep if people saw him. He's <laughs> I'll stick a piece of gum in right anyway. now <laughs> <laughs> well this is being so recorded just, you know <laughs> <laughs> so he would just uh he would just record random people chewing gum yeah that's weird Cause that's, he, that's... he always thought it was funny to watch people do it because most people chew with their mouth open they just, nom, 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 you know, just. sounds like a criminal minds <laughs> episode or something like that. Yeah, it does. Doesn't well, my dad definitely mm. had an interesting mind. <laughs> <laughs> I chew with my mouth closed most of the time. <laughs> Whatever. Yeah. And I guess That's I missed fine. the memo on the uh, striped shirt day. No. Oh. Yeah, you did. Shoot. So it missed it on the good hair day too. Joe, Jeff, you got a when great hair day going. We, nah, we got to, we got to talk big, hair. Mine's all, f- it's humid here. It's all curly and fluffy. Um, you're the one with the hair, not me. Anyways. I, 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 I'm like two months from a, from a hair. I, I can't get a hair appointment anymore. Like that's, that's one of the COVID things. I don't know if you guys have noticed that, but my, my, my stylist is booked out for like six weeks. Who plans six weeks ahead to get a haircut? You know, it's uh, annoying. So hmm. it's just, you just, you're just manscaping and that's it. No, no, I just, I just let it. Let oh, you it. just don't even do that. Wow. Okay. I just can't even, I don't have time for, uh, <laughs> for 
for a proper haircut anymore. I just wear a hat all the time until I come on here, I guess. Were you sporting a beard there for a while? That's my that's my winter look. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And uh, my, yeah. my wife gets fed up after about two days of that, but I let it go for a good three, four months. I, I dig the beard. I love the beard. It makes me look like a chin. Uh, <laughs> summertime. Beard makes you look work. like a man, huh? <laughs> yeah, totally. Totally. Grizzly Adams uh, had one. You should grow a beard, Jeff. Nah, I get it, it gets so long and then it just stops no matter what I do. It gets about that long and then it just stops. It won't grow anymore. And there's a lot of gray in there too. Quickly yeah. ages me. <laughs> so what's what's been going on with Bryce? What's up? It's uh what's going on? Fast what's going on at the business? The business is uh it's been a fast start. I mean you guys know what trade pending does, so uh we've mm-hmm. uh fortunately been in a really favorable position to help out a lot of dealers, you know? So inventory challenges, we mm-hmm. got a pretty good tool to drive conversations on trade. Uh, a little bit. Yeah. Got a, uh, so I think we've been busy. Uh, we've been hiring a lot of sales folks, building out our sales team, which is kind of continuous effort, uh, bringing in new senior management talent, CFO and things like that. Just hiring a lot of people, you know? So, uh, that's people the hardest thing to, work. to do. People wanting to work, but I got to tell you, the talent pool out there is uh, uh, thin's not the right word, but it, it, depending upon what you're looking for, you, you better be ready to compete with top talent uh, for top talent. And uh, that's that's been a good challenge that uh, we've, we've we've risen to the occasion. So I hired a CFO three weeks ago, first time I've ever had help in like accounting and finance and all sorts <laughs> of stuff. I'm learning what a CFO does, frankly, which is really impressive. Uh, and uh, new director this, uh, product, trade 10, pending. So you don't forget to send out those 1099s each year. Yeah, exactly. Those those can be a challenge sometimes. <laughs> it's the whole reason to get a CFO right there. I know, I know. <laughs> but you guys know the automotive market out there. You know, we're uh, uh, we're we're in, we're in a good position to be able to help dealers uh, launch a new product in January called the Buying Platform. The name alone kind of just describes how how helpful you know we want to be for dealers to continue to compete in acquiring inventory, um, and uh, it's always fun having a young fresh product in the market. Uh, to some of the things I think we'll talk about today, it's like you know you kind of get stuff out there and uh, get dealer feedback. Um, question for you, you said uh, how do I get into that? Actually, someone uh, won't do it this way. I think it was Ryan. Uh, Ryan Everson had posted something. I'm sure you've got some some talking points around this. I'll share my screen real quick. By the way, Jeremy Onspach and I are going back and forth trying to actually have a, a, a sit down meeting following that other Refresh Friday. Where yeah, you guys oh, yeah? are right there in the same neck of the woods, almost. It's close, yeah. They're all Carolinas. They're all Carolinas. You drive through them on your way to is, wherever you go out. No, you don't. You stop in Virginia. Is that? Nope. I don't make it all the way is down that, there. But here you go, Jeff. Oh, there we go. It's a nice delay. So uh, Ryan had posted something, and it's just one of those aha moments, or like, duh. But why weren't we doing it? Um, he was just talking about, you know, just changing up some verbiage on the website, maybe uh, in your top nav, and just using something as simple as sell trade. And it's like, duh, you know, but a lot of the, uh, uh, what he was pointing out is a lot of the, the, the uh, disruptors out there like to put that in there. And, and as car dealerships, we usually, you know, we, we've always been notorious for the value, my trade value, your trade, uh, trade value. It's never yep. been just a quick sell trade. And then maybe have a little bit of verbiage around that. Just talking about how, you know, we're currently, uh, you know, available to acquire your car, whether or not you buy a car from us or not. And uh, we had a couple other dealerships make this change and uh, went in here and shared their uh, their experience with that. And it's, they've all seen a nice uptick in uh, in lead count. Now I don't know about quality. I, I didn't read that far through, but definitely some lead count. Are you seeing anything around that? Was this your idea? I wouldn't be surprised if it wasn't. 
Um, no, I'm not going to take anything, take anything away from Ryan. He's a smart dude. Um, totally. But do you have any dealerships doing this? Did you recommend something like this? Uh, yeah, yeah, we, we have, you know, and we, we've even changed uh, a lot of dealer websites call to action when it when it comes to valuing your trade, actually talking about the current market conditions. Oh, by the way, you may have heard, you know, vehicle supply has never been where it is. You know, take a look at a trade mm -hmm. pending or market report. That's not what they say, but you know, take a look at the market for your car. You know, uh, our output, you know, post uh, form is different than just a value. Right? We show supply and demand. Mm -hmm. Um, which can then start a conversation, you know, which why Jeff, your car actually is worth 40% more today than it was January 1st. You know, uh, there's some, some, some free cases out there like that. Uh, but yeah, Ryan Everson is totally right. You know, just, uh, look, look what the big guys do. Uh, you know, five years ago, this is an interesting, you, you kind of made me remember, uh, uh, Tesla's website. I've got a screenshot of it. it I used remember to have, that. You've read a whole yeah, article about that. Yeah. It had like three buttons. You know, it was like, you know, mm -hmm. search for your model, value your trade and get finance. Like it was that, that was, that was yeah. all there was. You got to that Tesla, you could do three yeah. things. And Tesla didn't even buy any trades. They just knew that was an important part of the research process. So, you know, I think Did we they, Were they outsourcing that? I don't remember. You know, I, uh, I went through the process and they were partnered with some regional kind of wholesale operations uh, and you know back then right. you know Carvana wasn't even around at the time uh, but you know there's there's a lot of ways to get to get offers for your car today um, you know we're collecting tons of interesting stories of how consumers are changing their behavior too. get an offer here get an offer mm -hmm. there get an offer there Facebook marketplace see what happens dealers are gonna bite you know um, but uh, the, the the real key I think you know is consumers sentiment today and I'm looking up our analytics um, around our, our, our lead production has increased probably call it 15% year to date you know so if you change nothing else but just 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 our, our conversion uh, uh, on dealer websites I think we're on 3200 different uh, websites today uh, with snap so the analytics that we can collect are, are pretty valuable but consumers are more prone mm -hmm. to uh, take that call to action so it's more than just putting sell trade, you know, it is all about placement and UI. 70% of leads are on this and it doesn't say sell trade until you click the little you know, three buttons. So uh, same principles that we had seven years ago are working today. Make it easy for the consumer, start the conversation right. It's funny, we've got a, a series of calls to action in our app and the number one is trade appraisal. The second one is, believe it or not, I wanna buy this car. And somebody showing their commitment really? there. Yeah. Yeah. It's shocking. Every month I'm always like, wow, people are doing that. And the, we have some negative calls to action too. Like, are you serious? <laughs> and I had a different right. price yeah. or payment in mind. And, and those are actually the least ones that people interact with. I'm, I'm surprised at how, uh, how forthcoming folks are. Cause me, we're, we're trained or taught differently in the stores. Sorry. I, I misquoted my analytics. Check this out. All right. So, since January to June month to date, our overall conversion rate has, has increased 70%. What? And just steadily ticking up. Yep. And the form wow. completion rate, which is the same form, same form mm -hmm. used in January, same form used in June, that basically just says how many people are completing the process, went from 24.1% completion rate in January to 30.7% month to date in June. Like, that's as a, a percent increase, that's 30% increase. No other changes, just just the market and consumers' willingness to be able to get information and understand what's going on with their car. Hmm. What do you think's driving that? Do you think there's just messages out there? I mean, it's, oh, people we're, have we're, to know, you know that the, Consumers are wise. They are aware that the best place to <laughs> to get rid of their car right Dude, now I, is a car dealership. Yeah. Eh, that word is getting you drive around. by the lot, there's no cars on the lot. Yeah. I know that they need cars. Well, that, yeah, that part may be true, but uh, people are still asking the same stupid questions. And I, I don't know. I don't know. I can't give them that much credit. 
Alex. There's been a lot of media <laughs> coverage on it, you know, which makes consumers more curious and as they're shopping and By curiosity. That part, yeah. And they're, they're seeking information. If they come to dealer websites, which a lot of consumers, do, of course, do, you know, they're, they're, they're going to use that dealer website as an information resource. They're not just going to go to a third-party portal. Uh, as a matter of fact, we've got a survey that we uh, regularly quote that, you know, consumers have shown more sentiment to go to a dealer website than or preference you know, than third-party portals today than ever before. And that trend, I think, is going to continue. Your websites are better than really? portals are. It's a complete view of inventory. In some cases, better data if you have superlatives on your website, uh, and yeah, but you're you're not able to, you know, most most dealerships are going to allow you to to price shop and price compare, whereas you're going to get that with a, a third party site, <laughs> such as kind cars. dot com or something. Kind of, yeah. Oh, okay. Well, guys, so to make sure we're not false advertising here, want to want to switch back to uh, what we promised. <laughs> I'm glad George is here, by the way. He's gonna he's gonna keep us off topic. <laughs> yes, he and George will. is George is right. There's been more campaigns for buying cars year to date than than ever, right? Let's face it. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> well, and and you know, now we actually mean it. Now when we're sending out these campaigns, it says, you know, we wanna you know, we're in desperate need of inventory, we wanna buy your car for once we actually mean it. Yep. And that, always that's so gen- genuine of you, Jeff. <laughs> We yeah, always well, meant to. you know, yeah, yeah. no, we didn't. <laughs> that, that was probably one of the biggest, you know, more popular campaigns. How I see some businesses actually thrive off just that one campaign selling it to a dealership. What was the old, the old J letters? Remember the old? It was called the J letter. It was a campaign, and uh, you'd you'd. They would. It was sort of handwritten, and you send it out to your customers saying that they're, you know, you're interested in their car. And then there is uh, the new variation of the J letter. It was the digital J letter, where you print off an email communication from your sales manager asking you if your customer still has that vehicle, and that you would like to acquire it because we have a customer that's highly interested in it. I remember that one. You know, so yeah. You, yeah, so you actually email or <laughs> snail mail the customer with a copy of the email, making it look, <laughs> you know, all legit and, you know. I mean, it it, it works. It, and it you put a handwritten work. sticky note work. on top of the letter. Well, and that's yeah, what, I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm they would totally put a serious. J on it. That's <laughs> yeah. where it came from. It, you know, they just put a J on there, and it right. was, that's why they call it the J letter. <laughs> we come up with some interesting stuff in this industry yeah it's good well speaking of interesting stuff um going back to the beginning bryce you were talking about how you've hired a number of people of late and expanding the business you know we one of the things we want to talk about today is uh raising capital and some of the reasons why you might do that um and expanding the business is definitely one of those reasons um, you want to want to expand on that a little bit? Yeah, so I, I think uh, uh, you know most folks may not know, uh, but trade pending had never raised capital until December of 2020, and uh, we closed around with a, a private equity firm called Cap Street out of Houston, Texas, and recapitalized the business, which is basically just you know uh, shuffling up the ownership structure. Uh, recapitalizing the cap table. We'll talk about that. I'm happy to answer questions. Uh, but, you know, that was the first, you know, kind of big milestone for us in seven years. And, uh, you know, the reasons that we did that, uh, you know, are all about investment and growth and trying to, you know, continue to be in, uh, on the front end of, of doing new things. You know, so uh, now we've got a very aggressive capital partner, you know, so that's something we didn't have before. You know, it was uh, uh Bootstrapped, you know, plus uh, uh, tolerance for risk, you know, uh, you know can be limited <laughs> until you have, uh, you know, a capital partner, um, you know, that has the same desire as you to grow, uh, you know, more and more and more. So anyhow, your, your question, though, I mean, it, it, there, there's so many different cases. What's right for what company and when I look for? I mean, let's break it all down. You know, you want to start the company. You want to recap the company. You want to sell the company. There's there's a whole life cycle to uh, to these things. 
where do you want to start? Do you want to well, start one, you, you mentioned a term, uh, bootstrap, you know, for, for some, they might not know what that means. So yeah, bootstrap just means that you, uh, you go at it on your own, you know, you figure it out, you know, maybe you've got to borrow some money from uh, a few friends, but you know, you start, when you start a business, you have a cap table, that's a capitalization table. And if you put no money into the company, it's you're lying to yourself. You put some money, it's opportunity cost, something. But let's say you put a million dollars to start a company. If you've got five people that donate $200,000 each to that million dollar pool, then your cap table is pretty straightforward. It's 20% for each of those five. So um, every company must be capitalized. And frankly, I think one of the challenges in our market is companies that come to, to, to the market with really good ideas, but they're undercapitalized. They can't invest in the uh, talent. I'm talking mainly about software products and SaaS companies and things like that, not necessarily service you know, or consulting models. Uh, those, are, those are very different. Uh, but undercapitalization can be just a major constraint, if not a significant risk that the business may die, you know, because you've got to be able to invest in product, development, support, Oh, but don't forget about sales. You, know, you have to try to sell this stuff. It doesn't just <laughs> magically sell itself uh, unless you know Jeff. <laughs> mm-hmm. So that, that first round after, so let's say you, you start in a, you have an idea, right? And yep. you've got a little money or, you know, mom has some money or something like that and, and helps you get this thing off the ground. So you go out and, and bring in an investor or go hire some, some, by manual inputters in uh, another country and and you start to get this thing going so would your first step be to go after angel investors or a seed round or well i think uh, i think it's a very very simple question actually you know so you have to one you have to have a business plan you have to treat these things very formally you know so um, I, I used to write business plans for kind of fun and I practiced, you know, and before starting trade pinning, I was at Dominion, started the industry doing M&A work. Uh, but you have to take it very seriously. Like you've got your own board of directors, you know, that you're uh, submitting an investment memo to, right? And Google templates, you know, write a business plan, do a financial model. And that financial model is probably going to spell out to you very quickly whether uh, you should go for angel or seed or series A, B, and C. And the, and the one calculation you have to do is, is, is frankly, just size out your market. So uh, TAM, total addressable market. Uh, if you've got one product that's worth $1,000 a month times X many thousands of dealers times 12 months, your total addressable market is X hundred million dollars or whatever it is. But you can't lie to yourself. If you've got a $50 add-on that's interesting, like a, maybe it's just a little text feature or something like that, or an app. You can't lie to yourself that that fifty dollar, you know, uh, fifty dollars of value could represent a hundred million dollar opportunity. So if your total addressable market is constrained, then you need to start with something like an angel investor, uh, and 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 then develop into how you can grow your addressable market, more products, more opportunity. And then maybe you can earn your way into actually talking about uh, seed round. And then once you have a little bit of proof of concept, then you can earn your way into a series A, B or C. Uh, but there's no one way to do it. You know, the way that, the way that we did it uh, uh, is very different than, uh, than, than other companies. But I think you can do it uh, you know, very successfully multiple ways. Yeah, it's going to be a different path for everybody for sure. You bootstrap for a long time. Um, like it, it Is that the best tech. way to do it, if possible? Well, then you're uh, owning a bigger percentage of your company longer. Here, it, yeah. Here's the reality, though. I mean, the reason that I bootstrapped is because I wanted to focus not on raising money. I, I, I think I'd be terrible at that. Uh, I did not want to focus on... Uh, having a board, even though those can be really valuable. Uh, I wanted to focus 100% of my time on the product and the customer and the team. And, and I, I had a, a conversation early on. I was talking to a guy who was really good at raising money. And, uh, and I said, hey, how, how often are you doing that? You know, putting effort into raising money and talking to capital providers. And he goes, well, it depends. You know, sometimes when I'm, you know, we're really raising and other times we're not. I said, well, 
you know, what, what about when you're not really raising money? You know, how, how much time is that dominant? He said, 80% of my time, even when I'm not, hmm. you know, he's constantly managing that. So Alex, I mean, you tell me, uh, it, it's, it's a, it, it's a different structure. What have you heard, you know, from other companies too? It's, 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 we've, it's we've been fortunate to, um, you know, be in the Vermont area where so many startups have uh, come up out of the dealer.com acquisition. Um, and I've gotten to see a lot of flavors of this. So there's some where, and I'll, I'll try not to, to give away too many things about specific companies, but one in particular comes to mind is an extreme and that's dealer policy. And so they're selling insurance plans to customers on, on behalf of dealerships and the model uh, pays after years of that customer being on the plan. It doesn't pay up front. So in order to grow the business, they had to, to capitalize it very heavily um, to, to grow it to the volume that's necessary. But years down the road, the, uh, the, the payout, the profit, the revenues, grow, they exponentially take off. So you're laying that, that ground that they're doing. And so they've been nonstop fundraising to keep the business alive. Um, yep. You know, and, and we're Frickin Tech is another one where we have done smaller seed rounds to try and uh, grow the company enough to hold on to as much ownership as possible so that we know when it's time to, to really hit the go button on a, in a major way and, and uh, then we can go for that Series A round. We've been doing seed rounds to this point. Um, but, uh, you know, one thing in, in all of this, and I think that the dealer policy guys will say this, I, I think you might say it, Bryce, although we haven't talked in super depth about what it was for you, but I can definitely say on, on my end, uh, something that Mike Lane, one of the dealer.com founders, told me early on is he said every funding round is 300 hours of, of work. Wow. Think about that. After you do three, four rounds, you're, you're, you're an expert on funding. You know, so if you can bootstrap, go as long as you can, you know, um, but, you know, it, it's not the easiest way. <laughs> no. Um, Rick probably never heard the term bootstrap. Interesting. Yeah. Well, <laughs> yeah. Ty, you just pick yourself up by your bootstraps and go do it, you know. Uh, yeah. But. Uh, well, there's I another the option. Thing is recognizing. Yeah. What's the other option? Loans. Uh, I don't find, uh, I don't, I don't, <laughs> it was interesting. I, I, quick aside story in 2014, uh, I, uh, brought on Stephen Cole, our CTO and Scott Jahinko, our, 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 our chief revenue officer and North Carolina has an NC idea fund and we applied for it. And the application, you know, was like the most simple first application. And, uh, uh, first year we applied and we got a rejection. You know, it says, I'm sorry, you know, your, your, your idea is no good. Uh, like it was, it was the most motivating thing in the world. And I was just asking for like 40 grand, like, like just give me 40 grand. I'll hire some people in North Carolina. I already have. And they're like, no, nah, your, your, your idea is no good. Clearly you guys don't have any experience. So, you know, no, you get no 40 grand. Uh, so I was real pissed. And the next year we, we accumulated more, you know, a few more folks and applied again and we got declined again. You know, so, so I, I, I think yeah. I get really motivated by rejection, you know, <laughs> <laughs> Don't we all? And, uh, I was, I was, I was visiting with a guy who's on, uh, was on NC ideas board or something a few months ago. And I told him this story and he's like, Oh man, that whole thing's just a bunch of political, this, and that it was controlled by this guy. He was just trying to funnel money to his friends, you know, to like get their stuff. I'm like, it's all bullshit. Oh, yeah. So, you know, uh, <laughs> You could spend a lot of time chasing loans, SBA loans. I'm sure you know can can, can be helpful, but it, it, a SaaS business is not. You know, you have no fixed assets. It's it's very difficult uh, uh, to be able to uh, get that type of loan. And then, like Bootstrap, we should probably uh, define SaaS as well. Software as a service, you know. So uh, as you're hearing about, you know, these these M and A deals are going on year to date, and certainly last year, you know, I mean. Uh, software as a service, i.e., uh, back in 20 years ago, you used to actually pay a license one time for software. Uh, 
Uh, remember the auto base licenses back in the day. <laughs> Back yep. in the day, and they'd factor contracts to be able to fund future uh, liabilities and things like that. Well, SaaS just is, is is like we do with everything else in our lives, Netflix, Disney Plus, and so on and so forth, where we charge you just a monthly recurring fee. And, you know, contract terms could be month to month. It could be 12 months. But, you know, all these subscription services, that's, uh, that's software as a service. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Plenty of those out there right now. Yes, there are. Well, there's, uh, you know, yeah, we'll get, we'll come back to you, that. When we get you, to the acquisition strategy. I think we can talk about what, you know, how SaaS you, works. You will, o- you will own nothing. You will rent everything and you will like it. <laughs> pretty, 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 pretty. Well, pretty, there's some, there's much. some advantage on the dealer side to that. <laughs> it's, uh, it's disadvantages to vendors in some ways. Um, Bryce hit on one of them, whereas you have no assets, so you have no way to, to capitalize through the lending system. Um, so getting a loan is nearly impossible. They want to know how many computers you have, you know, do you own an office space, desk, chairs, that kind of thing. So if they have to, you know, come, come get anything, what can they sell off? And they don't know mm-hmm. how to sell your product. So they, they, they can't count or factor that in. The, uh, to the dealers, like something better comes down the road, cancel and move to the best, the next best thing. Um, mm-hmm. you know, so on the notorious for that, yeah, dealers don't do that at all. Um, but, uh, <laughs> it's, but it it's forces the perfect, the, it's the perfect lead feedback loop though, Alex, it is, you know, uh, I always say there's, there's, there's no better industry than automotive, not only to sell into, cause you can, you can get to decision makers quite literally from walk and just walk through the door. Uh, hopefully you can earn their time, but, but they will vote you in or off the Island every month, you know? So that, that constant feedback loop is very valuable. <laughs> keeps, keeps vendors getting, you know, evolving for sure. So, yeah, I think there's a lot of advantage in that model for the, the client, the dealer. Mm-hmm. And it might feel a little differently when you're the consumer of, you know, a, a rented service like a Netflix and you're like, oh, I got Netflix, I got Disney Plus, I got my Comcast or Cox service, whatever it is. And you're just adding it all up. And like, Man, I feel like I'm getting raped, but um, yeah, especially when you have kids. You are. <laughs> but <laughs> but as a dealer, I think that there's some advantage there. Um, so. The, we, the, the we cost were... of entry is very low too. Sorry, I was just saying the cost of entry is very low too. You know, uh, twenty years ago, dealers had to make big decisions. You know, uh, you know, a sixty thousand dollars CRM system, which included a server and on-site installation <laughs> and training and things like that. You were taking a lot of financial risk and process was, risk. Yeah, and and today, let's not talk about CRM, but I mean, you could you could switch websites like like underwear. You know, and uh, hopefully mm-hmm. you don't. It's probably not a great idea, but uh, the switching costs are 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 uh, very low. Another good point. So, another one here, Bryce, on our on our list of questions. And the first part yep. of this uh, this session is about investing. Um, so, on that note, you mentioned a cap table. Mm-hmm. Let's, should we define that and then talk about like from a dealer perspective, how important is it to understand who's on that cap table for that vendor that you're getting ready to do a big deal with? What the hell's a cap yeah. table? <laughs> cap table is a capitalization table. Kind of back to that example that I gave. If you started the company with a million bucks and had five people give you, you know, equal twenty two hundred thousand dollar investments, then the cap table's five names, five entities. Very, very simple. Um, if you're truly only bootstrapped yourself, the cap tables, you know, hundred percent, Alex, hundred percent, Jeff, whatever. Uh, that's the most simple form, but then it gets very complex. Certainly once you take in different rounds of investments and you have different classes of shares, um, we've always approached it, uh, incredibly simple, simple. Um, even after we were recapitalized, which is a term to say, all right, I'm going to take those, those five, 200,000 unit owners and I'm going to recapitalize it. And now magically the new entity, you know, has 10 different owners. 
uh, you know, some of them are, could be entities, some of them could be individuals, could be a trust. You know, a lot of folks invest huh. through trusts. Um, and, uh, and recapitalizing is nothing more than reshuffling the deck. Yeah. So I don't think the dealers, I, I, you got to know the vendors you work with, right? But you start with the people that you're, you're talking to in the store. Like, you know, you know, a tra- trade pending sales rep, you know, Eric Schnur up in Northern Virginia, Jeff Kersner. How long has Eric Schnur been in your bar? 20 years, 15 years, mm-hmm. you know, uh, you can trust a guy like Eric Schnur for choosing a company like trade pending and being there for four years. You know, he's, he's voting up with the decisions that that rep, that individual, you know, so I think it's probably more important to know Eric Schnur than it is to know the trust that's on my cap table. You know, that, that's, that's probably, it shouldn't impact it. Right. Um, well, what if, what if you've got a criminal on the cap table though? Well, you know, well, Jeffrey Epstein's <laughs> on your cap table. Now that's. <laughs> it would be difficult. Actually. I've, I've never been asked Bryce who owns trade pending actually never once through thousands and thousands of dealers, you know, signing up. Um, but, Who owns Trey Pending, Bruce? Uh, <laughs> I'll tell you later. No. Uh, well, Cap Street, uh, <laughs> as I said, private equity group has made a uh, uh, an investment. I'm very pleased with that. Uh, Bryce is a still owner, but you know that's uh, it's always a little bit more complex uh, once you take in money. As as Alex can tell you, cap table can get very lengthy. You could have a hundred different owners. Uh, different slices, options pool, you know, for employees, uh, restricted unit agreements. Uh, it can get very complex. There's a whole class of software, by the way, that manages your cap table. <laughs> I find that interesting. There's Good old Carta. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I, I would, uh, if you've got some some very trusted people on the cap table, though, that's something that. Uh, you'd want to, you'd want to announce to the world and, and whatnot. So that's, that's like a board of directors, you know? So, uh, we're actually building our, our, our board out. Uh, we'll actually have some interesting announcements as, uh, in the, in the coming weeks or months on, on adding industry veterans to, to our board. So I would take note, you know, uh, who's on your board, you know, are there folks that are, uh, proven, you know, trustworthy, you know, so, uh, uh, Alex, who's on your board? Who's your best board of your, your, your best director? Now, we've got a small board, but, um, but we strategically, uh, worked in, uh, some people who won, uh, Jim Crook from Vermont. He ran one of the largest companies here and sold it to GE healthcare years ago. And it's been a, uh, a mentor to some people at dealer.com and then um, he's, he's become a mentor to us. So helping just in general business ideas and you know, why, you know, when we were coming down the question of, do we stay LLC, do we become C Corp, S Corp, you know, all those kind of things. And then who do you, what lawyer do you use? What lawyer do you use for this patent? What lawyer do you use for, this employee dispute that came up, what lawyer do you use to create a a general contract for, you know, and and having that kind of individual who's been there, done that has been a huge value to us. You know, and then on the other hand, our, our our chairman of the board is Rick Gibbs and one of the dealer.com founders and CEO. And he's been able to really help on the engineering side because he was an engineer and setting, helping us set up better processes and, and things like that. So, I think those are more important to understand than, than who's on the cap table, in my opinion. You know, think about think about that as a dealer, Jeff. You know, um, if you're going to invest, you know, thousand dollars a month with me, you know, uh, one, you're you're probably looking at the idea and then the product and value it's bringing, right? But you know, wouldn't you feel better to know that you've got some industry veteran like like Rick Gibbs who's helping guide the company? You know, they've got really good intentions for the dealers. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it makes sense. Yeah, so cap tables. And then, yeah, table. God, we could have a it's whole other session about the different kinds of options and stocks. Oof. 
That's been keep a hell it of simple. Education keep for keep, me. keep it simple. If, any, if anybody ever wanted to start a company, though, you got to figure out how to keep it simple. And my only advice really is is try to you know, focus on your, your customer <laughs> and your product. You, you can't replace that. I, I I give an origin presentation to every new employee that comes to trade comes trade pending. I just did one this morning, actually. The best hour I ever give. I have two presentations actually. One is 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 truly the origin story, how we got started and what we did. And in there, it's got these little graphs of sales in the first year. And you know, there's the story of Bryce, you know, buying a Ford Focus and just driving, you know, around. And Scott Chahinko and I just crying to each other about how many people said no that day. Um, but my, my point is that I, we, I don't think that you should put yourself in a position to have to worry about um, a board raising money too much. Just just get out the gates and, and start building product. Hmm. What made you uh, decide to build a trade in evaluation piece? Well, I called a buddy of mine and said, uh, I got an idea. And I wonder was like, your feedback. At that, well, well, at that time, I think there was like 20 other ones out there. The buddy that I called was this guy named Jeff Kirchner. And, uh, <laughs> and, I, and I showed him a uh, I forgot about a that. Schematic. <laughs> yeah, you're, you, you just walked right into that one, buddy. <laughs> and uh, I literally called you the summer of 2014. And uh, I, had, mm-hmm. I had no prototype. And I said, here's what I'm going to do. And here's what I got. And he said, Bryce, the last thing the world needs is another trade. <laughs> I was being truthful, man. <laughs> I, uh, I did such a poor job of explaining to you what I w- was trying to do yeah. that I, I agreed with you. The world didn't need another trading tool. <laughs> and I don't think that's what trade spending does. Obviously, a lot of dealers know us for our trading tool. I almost accidentally talked you out of starting your own business <laughs> and you I, agreed with me <laughs> for, by then i'd already quit my real job so uh i uh, know yeah <laughs> I, was, uh, I, I was kind of stuck i was kind of stuck <laughs> like Sh- shit i gotta make this work no matter what <laughs> yeah yeah it's, it's, a, it's a good position to put yourself in sometimes yeah no i think once we got deeper in the conversation i do remember saying I, I remember the conversation. I do remember seeing there's a lot of them out there. So, and at the time there were, um, you know, quite a a few and there there's, and there still are, but you did start touching on some of the different things that you wanted to do with it. And then, you know, and I said that if you could find something to differentiate your tool from all the others, you know, something really different than, than like every dealership wants or needs some type of trade and evaluation tool on their website. So it's like, that's the easy part. That's like the shoe in, you know, we, the invention of a new valuation methodology, you know, was really our, our big innovation, you know? So the last valuation methodology prior to us to hit the market was I think Edmonds, you know, 20 years ago, which was just the mm-hmm. straight up mimicry. Every, every other thing, frankly, since, you know, is the same. They ask you 20 questions and here's a number. And if anybody yep. knows trade pending, you know, that's not how we do it. You know, we, we talk much broader, uh, about local supply and demand and what your car retails for. We, we introduced the notion of a comparable, uh, a comp, you know, to value an asset. And it turns out that, that that valuation methodology we call retail down. Some other very smart folks in the industry, you know, call it uh, retail back. Uh, but the, uh, the, the fact is your local market is very different than, than one 100 miles away. We can't regionalize data for value. And uh, based on what we see today, it is 100% about supply and demand. So that, that, that was our real innovation. And you got to wrap it in a good UI and UX. And uh, then you put it in an API and partner with all the best digital retailing tools, um, you know, marketing companies. We you know, trade pending services, 30 other, other vendors, which is a really awesome position to be in to just help other companies with, uh, with their data. Because most folks just assume they have to go to a book to get that data. Yeah. It's you're 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 welcome for all the introductions. Thank you, Jeff. I'll get you that. I'll get you. I'll get you that ten ninety nine this year. <laughs> yeah, thanks. <laughs> we'll we'll have to kick you back for one of those introductions too. Yeah. If it weren't for trade pending, I don't think our product would be as cool. Totally. So speaking of that, um, 
So, you know, when we're going to switch over here, let's talk about acquisitions for a moment. But I'm going to jump into this a little further down the the, the prepared questions path that we we set okay. up. So, um, so when it comes to product versus building a company to be acquired. You know, I, obviously you, you lean into the, let's build a better product. And if an acquisition ever happens, okay, then that that's an organic thing for us. Um, but 100%. You, yeah. How many companies have you come across in your M and a days where it was obvious that they had made that thing for an acquisition event? It, uh, <laughs> you could smell it like immediately, you know, it, it, to, to your point, I mean, you have to, you don't build, you don't start a company or build a product to sell it. You know, you, 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 you start that adventure because, you know, you've got a passion for making something different, you know, that or building a team, you know, um, or just being an entrepreneur. I'm not a really, I don't consider myself an entrepreneur, even though I started the company. Cause I've, I bought companies like our dominion ball companies from my like guys like John Max Miller who started mm -hmm. auto revenue and three other companies. That guy's mm -hmm. not, that guy, you know, uh, gave me the nod to take over for him when he left too. you know, very, uh, 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 uh very appreciative <laughs> of John Max Miller's early help, hell of a character. And, uh, uh, <laughs> he sold multiple companies, but none of those companies did he ever start out by saying like, I can't wait to sell this, you know? Uh, um, that's only so, if it's doing bad. Do you start saying that kind of stuff? I've, I've seen multiple books, you know, uh, doing acquisitions work 06 to 08, which is a different time. Now I'm going to age myself, um, in, in the dominion tower in downtown Norfolk, um, uh, working with a guy named Rich Crawford, very great guy to work with introducing me to the automotive space. And, uh, uh, we literally had a call down from the security guard and they said, Hey, there's this guy down here. I'll, I'll leave his name aside, but you guys would laugh your ass off. Right? told you his name. but uh so this guy down here wants to talk to you about selling his company to you and i said oh wow this is how it happens people knock on the door <laughs> in security so he came up we sat around the conference table and he uh he told us why it was going to be great for uh dominion to own you know his company and uh you could just you could just smell desperation <laughs> as soon as the security guard called up it was it was quite uh, quite funny but actually it was a really good company uh just not a fit for for what Dominion was trying to do at the time, um, but those those are not the assets that. Uh, that Did that they white wanna, label it later? Wanna... No, I can't remember what happened. That was too long ago. Uh, <laughs> okay, but you you can sense that as you know as, as soon as you, meet, you walk around in ADA, Jeff. You tell me, you know, you've been there. I mean, you can you can sense the difference between companies that are there to really just try to turn a buck versus oh, yeah. make a long-term yeah. impact in the industry. Yeah. Well, you know, and I've, I've run across quite a few companies that it seemed like they were just getting into the game because, well, what happened was they've sold, you know, that maybe, maybe the very first one, there was a lot of passion behind it and they got, I don't want to say lucky, but something went down. And within four or five years, they sold the product or the service. They sold the company to, you know, CDK or Reynolds for, you know, several million dollars. And it was probably worth $1. And now their next goal is to do it all over again. They just want to recreate that experience of building something out and selling it for stupid money to one of these larger vendors that are basically just buying it to shelf it so they don't have any competition. There's an investment I think I, for, I every, know for someone, every transaction. I know someone that I think sold three different companies to what, ADP or was it Reynolds? It might have been Reynolds. I think he sold three or four different companies and none of them were, I don't, I don't, I don't know how they evaluated these companies because they were just almost many, like ripoffs of other companies. How many companies did Larry Bruce sell to Reynolds? <laughs> Is that who you think it of? Uh, Larry Bruce has no. been very successful at selling <laughs> companies to Reynolds. You're right. <laughs> I know he has. <laughs> 
<laughs> I still uh, don't know what he sold. I think he sold like an SEO service or something and Dynamite hmm. Monkey service. And I, I don't know. Is he still in the oh game? God, I haven't heard so that funny. name. No, I haven't heard so that funny. name for a while. He's uh, he's doing uh, he was a, power sport. He was the original automotive Twitter troll. <laughs> <laughs> he was you're right. He was. Oh my gosh, Larry Bruce. That 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 yeah. There you go. What were we talking about? That that. <laughs> David Matter, man, that's so funny. Yeah, yeah. I don't know the story. Uh, but but Jeff, I think to, David to and I point, have a though, few stories around him. <laughs> No company ever sold or, or was purchased by one of those big companies with, with, with an idea to, to shelf it. Uh, you know, so I, I, was, I heard from my CFO guy. He said, you know, 96% of public companies' uh, acquisitions, quote, unquote, don't work. 96%. And, and, and don't work, obviously, is a broad category. But you nailed it. You said why. It's because once they are purchased, by the large entity. Yes, there could be some technical integration opportunities. We've seen what Cox has done with their collection of, of companies. It's slow, it's painful, but guess what happens? Mm -hmm. As soon as those companies get their hands a little dirty, Dominion, you know, I had a lot of experience with this, the passion gets lost, right? You know, who were the pa who, who was responsible for the passion and the innovation? Who was the tech team doing late, late nights trying to get that push out for that, that feature that a dealer requested that actually is really broadly appealing to a lot of dealers? You know, who's the sales guy now who's, you know, getting pushed hard to hit quota for the month, you know, and prove out, you know, a record sales month. Does that happen at CDK or, or some of the large publics? We don't need to pick on CDK. Less so, less so, right? Yeah, I think it does happen in pockets within those bigger companies. Yeah. Yep. Dominion had a, a a great team. I've lost touch with the who who, who the active team there is, but I, I I was really fortunate to get my start uh, with the company like Dominion, who was who was significantly hundred in two thousand six was when I joined. Uh, they had just broke up from the trader public the trader mm -hmm. partnership, you know, where Landmark Communications and Cox Communications were fifty fifty partners for 15 years. And they took, they took that business. That's, those are the best stories I have, by the way, figuring out how they executed on that. That was a total uh, vertical integration play. They went up and down the value chain for those print publications, auto trader publications, mm -hmm. and they owned everything. They owned the paper, the ink, the print, the distribution, and, and they built a significant business. Literally you know, took it to a billion plus in revenue at 40% ish margin. I think I'm not under NDA anymore on that, but yeah, broadly <laughs> striking. They, they, they executed perfectly around mm -hmm. that, uh, that, that print, uh, roll up and a uh, roll up strategy is when you see if there's a hundred different players that do the same thing, then we're going to roll them all up. And so a uh, trader back in the day literally would buy these mom and pops, little trader publication sites. And Cox, and this is worth the story, Cox and Landmark were the active investors. And they would roll in, kind of Mitch Brooks, uh, uh, one, uh, un unbelievably automotive veteran, uh, uh, you know, would roll in and they would you know, write down a number. They'd present it, they'd present it to, uh, you know, Luis, who owns, you know, the Richmond, Virginia, you know, trader publication. And they'd walk out, and there was Cox standing right next to him with their number. <laughs> and so, instead of uh, instead of fighting on sticky notes with written numbers, they said, "Why don't we partner together?" And uh, and that's when Trader Publications was born. Fifty fifty partnership between Cox and Landmark. And then the first day that I went to work for Trader, I was hired by Trader Publications, and I showed up on September eleventh, two thousand six. And they said, oh, uh, yeah, so we're now Dominion Enterprises. And they had actually separated the partnership, which had been very successful, obviously. And Dominion Enterprises was born, and Cox took all the auto trader, uh, the mm -hmm. auto trader assets, all the print, as well as what, what remained of, kind of the online assets as well. And Dominion was born. Hmm. Interesting. Was there a... I gotta, I gotta wonder, like, why, why did Dominion 
give that up? What was it that was it a big number that Cox offered? What, what I, got? I I I so no, it looks I think, like I Jeff think... found something here. Hold on a second. There he is. Oh, yeah. <laughs> hey, Larry. Glad you could join us today. Can you hear the audio? No. <laughs> oh, that sucks. <laughs> no. <laughs> that was that was a video Can Alex you... <laughs> put together where because Larry Bruce would just talk about himself over and over and over. So <laughs> yeah, Alex he edited it and cut this video up where it's just Larry. Hi, I'm Larry Bruce, founder and editor and co editor and co chief and co owner. <laughs> <laughs> it went on for like 10 minutes. <laughs> That's sort of an inside joke. That sucks that the volume doesn't work. Why don't you just lip sync for them? <laughs> no. <laughs> you'll, you'll have to post that somewhere now, Jeff. <laughs> if, if Larry's out there, can we just have like quick special guest appearance? I think we should uh, do we a could. fourth series <laughs> with, with the story of Larry Bruce. Uh, man, if we could do that with Larry Bruce and Matt Watson and uh, maybe have K-Car on too, that would... K-Car. Yeah. <laughs> so, anyway, that was that was a... Might have spared you from something there, Bruce. Um, I see Jeff's trying to play it again. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Trying to get the volume. <laughs> I'm gonna post. I'll post that up over in the forums. Yeah, your your community is is fairly veteran, uh, so I'm, I'm, yeah, I assume that most folks are yeah. are are, uh, are getting getting all of these uh, these jokes. I know David Metter's got bound to be laughing. So yeah, yes, he is. <laughs> all right, so um, oh boy, Jeff, you gotta stop, man. They can't see this stuff. <laughs> <laughs> I've always right, to make well, this into a into a meme. <laughs> <laughs> I can't see it either. So, all right. Well, know. here's here's another one. Question. So we just saw a bunch of acquisitions go down the digital retailing community. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, we know there's more coming. Mm -hmm. Is there anything hmm. we can elaborate on? That. Without getting in you trouble say that, here, you say that with confidence, Alex. I know of one and, that's uh, pretty pretty imminent. Hmm. What? Well, which ones just went down? Uh, so you had Google. Prodigy in March, um, which is the most interesting one of all because they had ninety five dealers and sold for a hundred million dollars. Um, that's crazy. Yeah. Why? Uh, they, they had. They, they, they sold it to a bank uh, at the time of sale, 95, I believe. It was less than 100. That's, yeah. They got like a 20 Pan, or 30 sometimes multiplier. It was crazy. Well, how? They split. Like how does that, how does, Bryce, how does something like that happen? And how come you haven't sold trade pending <laughs> well, let for me, let 100 me million? And, this and this goes back to, Jeff, this goes back to something we were originally talking about, about you know, valuation of uh, SaaS companies, which I'll let Bryce mm -hmm. define, but there's other uh, categorizations like FinTech. And I believe that uh, Prodigy was able to position themselves as a FinTech company. And the multiplier on FinTech is way higher. Um, so Bryce, let, let you go ahead and, and speak to that on SaaS. What, on valuations? Well, yeah. or valuations in general, sure, yeah. Well, uh, it's it's actually really simple, and I've I've learned a lot in the last you know kind of year you know on this. Uh, but you know, there's the, much like trade pending valuation methodology. It's all based on comps. It's all based on supply and demand. It's still an asset, right? So SaaS is is very favorable because it's highly predictable revenue, uh, generally highly scalable, and 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 there's a there's this rule. You can Google it. Rule of forty. You can also Google rule of fifty. Rule of 40, I think, is probably the predominant one in like the investor community, which simply talks about, you know, um, how you can prove, you know, uh, that you're a high growth company. 
uh, worthy of high multiples. Rule well, 40 is nothing more than your growth rate year over year. So if your revenue goes up 50%, that's your revenue growth rate, 50%, uh, plus your EBITDA margin, earnings for interest tax depreciation, basically your, 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 your margin, how much income you can, you can generate. And so if those two added up are over 40, then generally those uh, uh, are worthy of, of a higher premium or even a revenue multiplier. So uh, mm. if you're less than that, uh, chances are, you know, you're worthy of a smaller, maybe revenue multiplier still, uh, or uh, in a multiple of EBITDA. So public markets trade at 17 times total. I don't know what the latest is, but call it 17 times trailing, you know, uh, price to earnings. I think that's the average for S&P. So 17 times your EBITDA. Now, those are much more efficient assets, obviously, than private companies that don't trade quite that often. Um, but you can do the math and figure out what Carvana's multiples are right now. Uh, and, uh, you know, auto has a lot of demand. It's uh, still a very, very uh, uh, high growth, you know, uh, industry. Uh, there's still a lot of change that dealers are, are making every day to, mm -hmm. you know, continue to modernize. Do you find that, do you find that a lot of outside investors aren't overly familiar with the automotive business, but since it's such a big business, um, it sort of gives you a little bit of an advantage. Uh, yeah, I think, you know, you can't, you can't ignore the, uh, the, the, the total size of the automotive market. Uh, mm -hmm. Even if you only focused on franchise auto dealer spend, you know, uh, NADA data does a good job every year. If you've ever thought about starting a company, go download the NADA data guide from 2020. It would give you all sorts of interesting, you know, averages, facts, and figures. But I think uh, in 2020, dealers spent, what, $7.8 billion on advertising? $7.8 billion, which was down wow. from $9.2 billion in 2019. That's a lot of $1.4 billion down. You know, that's just on <laughs> advertising. Like yeah, that doesn't count softwares. No. Or even the services. All, yeah. Or the services and CRM data and things like that. So that's one slice. Then you got, you know, that's tier three, just franchise dealer. You know, you can talk about independence. You can talk about, um, uh, you know, other things. Uh, but you know, the then you got tier one. Yeah, wholesalers. It's it's a gigantic industry, Jeff, to your point. And, and I think there's, there's a lot of invested outside, you know, capital that's searching around for you know interesting and predictable industries that are going to continue to have investment and modernization and i think we all know mm -hmm. automotive has been where I've, I've been here for 16 years and i've never seen the investment cycle slow down it's, it's going to take a long time to get there well that's a now nah. there's a predictor for you so you know when when people bring up uh you know car dealers are going away you, know, you should always look at the kind of money that's being pumped into the industries that support it. So like you said, Bryce, it, it sure looks healthy right now. It's kind of like uh, investing in Miami. People are still doing it, even though it's supposed to go underwater one day. So yeah, right. Totally. <laughs> totally. <laughs> but, but yeah, I, I, you know, the digital retailing thing is interesting. You know, by my last count, there's probably 25, 30 digital retailing tools in the market. Uh, uh, with with different points of differentiation, obviously, Roadster and Govagoo both trade pending API clients, um, and uh, uh, I think that there is a first wave, but the, the the second wave I think could be even more interesting. You know, which is in a few years. Imagine how refined after all this investment. There was really only a first wave of investment. You know, for the for, for the digital retailing, and so there's some oh. early profit takers you know, some, some early winners on that first round, the, the, the investment wave is not stopping at all. If anything, that's going to challenge, you know, CDK and Reynolds now have an opportunity to integrate. Now they have now an opportunity to differentiate their products uh, and digital retailing even more to help dealers. And if they can't execute on that, then guess what? The startups are going to have plenty of opportunity left. Uh, but I think there's probably a few more digital retailing tools to get, to get purchased, but I look at it as more investment, period. Yeah, you got just it. just invested in, you know, Reynolds invested yeah. in Gubbagoo and CDK invested in Roadster uh, or whichever way it was. Yeah. 
He invested a lot. For a they big part of the cap lot. table. <laughs> yeah. For a big part of the cap table. There you go. So they got one person <laughs> to the cap table. Now. <laughs> so George Ninny was saying that, uh, and I hadn't heard this one, but I guess he's predicting that Cox is going to pick up Autofy. I heard something about that. I heard that yeah, leaves. I heard that in the gray fine. Hmm. So the then, one I the so, one I've been hearing the most chatter about's been Darwin. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean hmm. you don't really hear much about that company, do you? Well, Darwin's got thousands of I dealers mean, see, that are using their really? mingling product. Uh okay, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I don't think but when Darwin's you say digital big, big, retailing, I mean you hear Roadster, uh, dealer inspires piece, um, Carnell, Carnell by now. I yeah. always thought Carnell um, would be an interesting one for car gurus because they're right there in the same Boston area, and that Carnell team uh, has a good representation in, in in Atlanta. But you know that. That company has had some of the smartest. You, you want to talk about capital raises and and proven entrepreneurs yeah. coming into the space and executing really well. Um, Andy Park is a friend of mine. I mean, there's there's no finer operator, uh, and and their products. Uh, I've, I've known a lot of dealers have pretty good products. products. Yeah, yeah. It's no, yeah, I've been using some variation of the products for quite some time. Mm-hmm. And good people over there. Everybody knows, you mm-hmm. know, a handful of the car now folks, Jeff Brooks. Yep. Doesn't get any, any better. Tim, uh, all just a really solid team. Mm-hmm. Hmm. Hmm. My, well, what's, uh, uh, Jeff, you were going to ask something. Yeah. I was looking for, some other old school photos and videos here. Oh, well, maybe we're I must have them hidden somewhere. <laughs> yeah, I must have them hidden somewhere. <laughs> well, there was a whole slew of uh, other questions that we had ready for Bryce, and that they would have been a fun one. We'll have to come back and do another one sometime, more of like, how is the sausage actually made? You're your questions were way too dense to possibly get through in 45 <laughs> minutes or an hour, you know? True. And I'd, frankly, I'd, we have to let Larry Bruce take us out. Figure <laughs> out the- All right. Can you put that well, back I got, up? I got, I got uh, what? I don't know oh, maybe this, I can do it. Yeah. I don't know if the audio still works. I have a, a, a final question just because I had it written down from – Sure. The list here, but how long? So, how long have you had uh, trade pending now? How long has it been? Six years. Yep, seven years. Seven years. May of twenty. May of twenty fourteen. I posted on Facebook. I was starting a company. If uh, you're a younger company, let's say less than ten years, or or really doesn't have to have an age stipulation around it. Um, And there's a lot of variables maybe involved, maybe too many. One of those questions, but how do you like? How do you know when to sell? That's uh, sort of a loaded question, but I don't know. I've often, you know, put myself in those shoes and be like, "All right, when would I sell? Would I sell whenever I lost the passion? Would I sell whenever someone just offered the big nut? Would I just never sell and just?" See what happens. I don't know, and I know my answer probably changes as, as as I continue to get older. I probably if someone offered the right. I'd probably jump on it, and I'm sure you see that across the board. You know, if uh, if the company's younger, a little bit more younger mentality in there. You've got uh, you know younger generation. Uh, yep. Maybe they're not. You know, they sort of want to hang on to it and make the most of it. Whereas, you know, you're a little bit up there in, in age and you know that maybe you could recreate this again and, and not get yourself into some type of crazy non-compete. 
I don't think uh, the age matters so much on this one, Jeff. Yeah. It's very personal. Yeah. Like, yeah. I, I, I was, I was thinking it, it, it is very personal, but it also is very, uh, I mean, every sales, every story, you know, is, is very different. The individual, what were their goals to start the business, you know? Uh, and, uh, what age, what do they want to do the rest of their life? You know, I mean, I'm, I'm not a passionate startup, repeat, startup, repeat, startup, repeat person. Like I, I did yeah, that. Some people I, are, man. I'm they glad I did it. that. Some for. people love that, that super early stage stuff and they're really, really good at, it. um, mm-hmm. uh, I like early products. And as long as I could do that within, you know, uh, this industry and continue to try to develop new and young and interesting products. I think I'll be really happy. I love partnering with, with vendors, but the, uh, the, the decision also determines like, I mean, the company, you know, you know, if you really paid attention to the company, like trade pending, trade pending was going to have significant benefit with a new cap structure, new capital partner to be able to invest into growth, formalize board structure, and shoot for the moon. You know, we, we, we want to continue to grow and all of our employees, they want to grow, you know, they want to grow their careers. Mm-hmm. So, uh, uh, for that reason, we chose that type of transaction. Now, if there's an opportunity, you know, for a major public company, you know, to take advantage of what we built and you one day feel like, you know what, that integration could be unique. And then, you know, those reasons should be the reasons why you sell so many times. Of course, if you, if you ran a process, we could talk about bankers and processes and all sorts of things on another call. Uh, the assumption that just, you know, whoever pays the most is going to win. That's it, probably so if, if, if it's only uh, financial investors, you know, making that decision. But there also is, is a lot of considerations about, well, what's going to happen with the company going forward? Is this a good home, you know, for yeah. the next chapter of that company's story? There should be at least. And the other side to it, Jeff, is um, even with investors, companies can have dividends. So with profits, you can do various payouts to uh, keep the investors happy and make sure everybody's sharing in the pie uh, similarly. Mm-hmm. So there's you can go ongoing that way. Um, I have heard some people say, um, our, our chairman of the board in my company, um, He's, he's had this notion of 30, 30, 30. So no more than $30 million of revenue, no more than 30 employees and no more than 30 hours a week of work. And to him, that's retirement. Mm -hmm. (laughs) It sounds like retirement to me. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. This this is a guy who works. He is retired technically right now. Um, He definitely does not need to work, but, uh, but he's still doing 90 hours a week of, of work. Yeah. I'm getting chats from him at six in the morning and midnight. So, so that's the goal is, is the the 30, 30, 30. Well, that's, that's something that he considers, uh, you know, a real fun, you know, in game for himself. Yeah. So, but yeah, I don't (laughs) think he ever wants to go back to like working at a a company as large as a Cox, for example, you know, that was, that was soul sucking for him. Right. But, yeah, that. And not necessarily Cox. I'm just saying the size. You know, you get you yeah, get a yeah, lot yeah. of bureaucracy going on. It's hard to, if you're it's a an, weird choice, an innovative so person, um, it's it's hard to get things through and, and feel excited. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that would wear you out real quick. Yeah. Well, but, Bryce, it's always a pleasure, man. I always enjoy it, guys. Really uh, good to see you, yeah. Jeff. Uh, love watching the show too. Keep building the community, man. It's it's funny. All these years later, Deal Refresh I think is actually more valuable today than it ever has been. Um, I need to get on the. Well, we appreciate more. that. I'll yeah, you that. should. Used to write an article and used to come in and participate and let's say get, hello. Let's get more dealers. And... Yeah, how can we get more dealers subscribed? You guys need to report back to us like subscription rates over time or something. And then figure out how to challenge your community to like grow that. Uh, it's actually right on the, the homepage of the forum. You can see the community uh, count and everything. Yeah. We can't always tell who's too. a dealer and who isn't. And <laughs> right. of course the, the dealers, uh, 
you know, they, they sign up with their dealership email, for example, um, Mm -hmm. and leave and go to a different store. Sometimes they get lost to us, but (laughs) yeah. Yeah. And, um, and there's, you know, there's a ton that will sign up and, you know, they'll jump on the site, but they're not logged in and never log in, you know, or they're just, you know, our, our, the, it's probably, what would you say, Alex, uh, one out of every eight people on the website are logged in. The rest are hanging out in the background. And oh, it's a much higher ratio than that. It's yeah. Yeah. It's like 15 to one. Okay. Yeah. And Bryce is yeah, usually for every one, one person you can see on that sidebar. There's 15 others that are browsing the site. Yeah, you're minute. right. You're right. Because there's times I'll I'll look and there's like two, you know, 200 plus, and and that's minus bots. That that supposedly takes the bots out, but there mm-hmm. would be like over 200 people and only you know 20, 30 logged in. Yep. So, but you are right. It it's sometimes it's just a platform challenge, but get to get more people logged in. And I never wanted to, you know, we've, I've often thought about the approach where you can only see the first X amount of characters, or you can only read, you know, the initial, uh, discussion topic, uh, but you can't read any more comments unless you log in or sign up. Mm-hmm. We've toyed around with that as well. So maybe well, we'll give it, it takes a lot of time for you guys to do what you do. So I just, I just wanted to say yeah. thank you. Thanks, Brad. Hey, I just <laughs> you got a lot of free like time. I know Brad. Alex and Jeff. I mean, tons of free time. So <laughs> I wanted, it was good, good to see you fill it with something. Yeah. Well, you take some of that free time and come up here and visit. We'd like to have you on board and come I, uh, I, come have, come have dinner with us again. That'd be great. I I will do that for sure. All right, gents. Happy Friday. All right, you got it. Yep. See you. See you as well, sir. See you guys.